Welcome to Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, night two, where a bunch of people whose name you'll forget a year from now, uh, by this time next year, you'll have forgotten every, uh, most people's name, but also Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, and Kamala Harris. They all square off for the right to be the person to disappoint Democrats next November. <sighs> Millions of Americans tuned in for a conversation on differing opinions as how to best lead our country in a post-Trump America. Instead, we saw a brutal assault of a 73-year-old, more focus on torch passing than an Olympic opening ceremony, and some of the most awkward on-camera banter since Bryant Gumbel and Deborah Norville. Yes, the Trump Report election night special, night two, starts now. You're tuned in to AfterBuzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz Yes, welcome to a very special Trump Report. I am Christian Blatt. Joined as so often by Chelsea Galicia. Hi there. And look down there, way at the far end of the desk. It is the return of our friend Drexel Hurd. Hello, everybody. Drexel, hello. Hello. Thank you for finding your way into the studio (laughs) to give us some of your time. Uh, I would like to, as uh, you know, usually we would be chivalrous and we would go ladies first, but Drexel, really, it's more of a guest at this point. (laughs) So I need to know. uh, We're going to talk a little bit about last night a little later in the show, but I really want to get started talking about tonight. Just overall thoughts. Uh, who do you think that this was a particularly good night for, and who was this a bad night for? Um, you know, I think that, first off, I think that it was a really good night for Democrats in general. And Fair. a really bad night for D- Donald Trump and Republicans in general. Um, if I was to pinpoint, like, a handful of people, uh, Kamala Harris definitely won the night tonight. Um, just not on, not on, not only on policy, uh, but also uh, on on the way that she kind of handled herself on the stage and personality. Yeah. Um, Pete Buttigieg certainly did well. You know, you cannot uh, deny the charm of the vice president, um, Vice President Biden, uh, and Kirsten Gillibrand. I think she's an honorable mention in that as well because I think she started out really strong, um, kind of cutting her way into a ten-person conversation. But uh, it is undeniable that our junior senator here in California uh, definitely won the night tonight. Um, before we talk about, you know, who had a less than great night, uh, same question for you, Chelsea. Who do you think uh, particularly stood out as having a good night for you? Well, I was pleasantly surprised by most of what I saw from Kirsten Gillibrand, and I was kind of surprised about that. She was really good at sticking to the theme of money and politics and mm-hmm. corruption, which is, as she said it, the the one issue that all the other ones stem from. If we can't clean that up, how do you clean up the rest of the mess on every single issue? And then she disappointed me when they went through and asked, you know, what is the first issue that you right. would address? And she said something about, uh, she talked about family. She talked about her signature issue, which is uh, universe, pre-K, universe but, pre-K and stuff like that. But so. the, the, again, then that's focusing on sort of the symptom rather than the cause. And she was doing so well at speaking of the cause of the problem, money and politics, corruption, so on and so forth, that you fix that, then you can fix family leave. So um, that was great. And then I was disappointed by that. Kamala Harris is um, great on, I thought, on personality because she showed that she can go head to head with Donald Trump. I think being from California is probably the biggest thing she's got going against her. Actually, as proud as I am that she is our senator, she's got that going against her. Of course, I've got a way on how Bernie did. You know, Bernie was Bernie, which is great for consistency. And I feel like he's like the the, the grandfather of progressive politics. And Great he, grandfather, but go on. Maybe you're right about that. <laughs> um, and and then now sort of the the younger leaders have, have taken the torch, actually. Um, I, I don't think Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders needed to hand it specifically to Eric Swalwell for the younger people to actually take the ideas of Bernie Sanders that were so radical in 2016 that are now pretty common and everybody's saying a, a variation, a degree of what he was, what he made an issue uh, in 2016, which is Medicare for all. But again, um, for me, the ones that stood out were all the comments about the money and politics. And I, I, I thought that Andrew Yang did a good job of getting in there from a nobody to say, I have a solution to the problems that got Trump elected. A lot of it has to do with automation. And one of the solutions is this freedom dividend. He didn't obviously get a chance to explain it. But I think he got himself in there. Um, 
Well, and Pete Buttigieg made a great case for him to be vice president. I, I, it just would be beautiful for him to replace Pence. And I actually thought that the most, uh, the, the issue that hurts him the most, um, the relationship with the black community because of the police shooting involved in his community, I think he had the best response that you could have, which is, I didn't get it done. For somebody to admit that they could not do it the, could, and, and didn't make an excuse for it. Just said, I haven't gotten it done. And we can't expect our leaders to be perfect in every area, but to take responsibility for where he has failed and not kept up to the, the vision and the goals and the, the promises that he's made is, is the least that somebody can do and is a very different picture from Donald Trump. Who Could you imagine him taking personal responsibility for anything. So I, I thought that that was actually a highlight moment of the entire debate and him personally, aside from his uh, hypocrisy about the Christians. That was pretty great, too. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, uh, President Trump, I think, will certainly take credit for having much better ratings on Celebrity Apprentice than Arnold Schwarzenegger ever did. I think he will certainly <laughs> take all the credit and responsibility That's for that. That's not personal responsibility no, yeah, for I, when you don't when you I, don't I think, do well. I when, think we disagree about how important that was and what a disaster <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger was for this country. Um, but no, I do know what you mean, obviously. And uh, for me, I'm look, everything, you guys, everything that you both talked about uh, I, I don't disagree with any of it. I think that a lot of people had uh, good moments. Uh, for me, uh, let me put it back on both of you. Do you think it's a great night for somebody like Eric Slawwell, who I think I even, don't even say his name right. We know but his Swalwell. name. Swalwell, yeah. He but see, but here's, on our show. Yeah. But, but, well, see, there the you go. Show, yeah. See, that's that, So that's a, that's a great starting point. Just for the fact that people are seeing him probably for the first time. Uh, I, I I knew he was running for president, and I'd read articles that he was mentioned. I don't think I'd ever actually seen him speak before. I must have missed that episode you, of your show. You, he's on a lot of cable news. Right. He's been well, putting himself out there. Here's the thing, though. I think that uh, an event like this is... Look, it, it's like the Super Bowl for well, it's, it's like the first round of the NCAA playoffs for people who watch cable news. But I think you have people who don't follow so closely are going to tune in for something like this. And when you see somebody like that, and you know, he definitely had good moments. I mean, I think he leaned on the uh, passing the torch thing one time too many. I, it was just like, oh, I kind of wish he had something else. Uh, how much of a of a success is a night like this? Look, this is a guy who's not going to be the nominee. That's not the point. But for getting attention and and for getting attention. For for his issues, to me, I think it's a really good night for him. I mean, he definitely built his brand because mm -hmm. he stuck to one issue, which is gun violence. Um, great for him. I, I think, again, the problem of gun violence is only going to be fixed when we f fix the corruption that doesn't allow the will of the American <coughs> people to be sh to show up in our legislation. So he should have brought up the reason why we can't do anything about gun violence is not just specifically the NRA and the gun lobby, but because of the laws that make it uh, able for the gun lobby to have so much power in our democracy. I was waiting for the candidate that was going to frame this entire election. And it's not an election against Donald Trump. You can do that, but that's like playing like medium, mid-level field. The real frame could have been something like, this is an election against, uh, is against corruption and for democracy. So Donald Trump represents the party of corruption. Between him and Mitch McConnell, I, I don't know how you, you have a poster child for corruption better than those two. And then our solution is strengthening democracy. And that's how I feel that you, uh, would a candidate could have framed this whole election and set themselves heads above everybody else by being sort of larger than just getting stuck in the weeds of the policies, which are, of course, important. But at this point, we need somebody to set themselves apart and frame the whole issue, frame the whole election. And by the way, who better to feature on a poster than two of the most attractive men in Washington, D.C., than Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell? So I think that <laughs> as poster children, they are perfectly suited for that. Uh, Drexel, uh, my sort of my point uh, about... Swalwell, Swal, yeah, Eric him. Swalwell. Yep, him. Yep. I feel like you're about uh, to call him Coleslaw or something Coleslaw. like that. I mean, if his name was Coleslaw, I'd remember it. Believe me. Uh, is there somebody that's you know? Let's be honest. The 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 lower tier, most of them were represented last night. But for people on the stage tonight that you know aren't the more high profile, uh, who stood out? Maybe uh, who surprised you? Let's put it that way. Um, I I think Michael Bennett 
from Colorado. Certainly, uh, yeah, I think some of the governors, uh, not only Michael Bennett in night two, but uh, Jay Inslee in night one, um, you know, they certainly talked about their time as governors and their success in governors, even to the point that, you know, John Hickenlooper, um, uh, you know, he came here to California a couple of months ago, got booed on the stage at the California convention. I was in the hall at the time that it happened. Because he said no, uh, um, no socialism he talked about or socialism. no Medicare he just said, No, he just said that socialism is not the future of the Democratic Party. Um, and, you know, California being as left-leaning as you can be, um, certainly the Democrats, um, California Democrats are certainly a lot more liberal than the state as a whole. Uh, however, uh, that certainly didn't go over well. However, but, but at the same time, tonight he laid out this is what I did as governor pretty effectively uh, in certain po- in certain points um, and and talked about that. So um, I, I think between Michael Bennett and Governor Hickley, all the governors did well. Yeah. Uh, uh, all the governors did well to talk about what they would bring to the table being fr- being an executive of their state. I would agree so f- with you so far as saying that Michael Bennett, uh, it's not his first name, I forget. Michael Bennett, yeah. Yes, had a, a his really first great... His name is Swabble. <laughs> had a great a- a answer in that gridlock won't end unless we get rid of Mitch McConnell. That is some, some truth. We need to win the Senate. He sp- spoke about gerrymandering. I think he was the only one who mentioned the word. And today was a horribly historic day in the in in the issue of gerrymandering the supreme court just said we're not going to get involved in partisan gerrymandering where representatives will intentionally draw the districts to their liking to keep their political party in power instead of accurately representing the 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 electorate so let's just say like in north carolina it's about half and half Republicans and Democrats, but they drew the lines in such a way that 70% of the seats went to Republicans. And the representative who did that made it very clear. I pref- He said, quote, I prefer Republicans. I drew things in a way that would be better for the country because I believe Republicans are better for the country. And in a very divided um, decision today along ideological lines, the conservatives said that the Supreme Court would be overreaching in its uh, judicial power to step in and, and put a stop to this, which I think is just unbelievably unbelievable that the Supreme Court would not step in to protect our elections, which is, you know, I, I don't know how, I don't even know how they well, can justify that. I don't want to get bogged down on that issue because we're but talking about, but let me just, let me just issue, the, because it's, it didn't come up tonight. That's why we're not going to really talk right. about it. But, but, but my point about that, that I will say is that you can make the argument that that is not for the Supreme Court, that that is, that is a state's rights issue, and that's why they could they could logically not want to get involved with that. Uh, what were you going to say, Drexel, and no, then we'll move I, back to the I was just going to say, because you know, Chelsea brought up the corruption portion of it, and I know that Democrats, uh, just as a party, have been talking about the long-term strategy. And I don't know that tonight was the night to talk about Donald Trump and the corruption, because there's a lot of candidates. Uh, there are 10 candidates on the stage. I think in the next debate, we'll probably see maybe half of those people not meet meet the threshold of 100,000 yeah. individual unique donors. And uh, so those are the times that those people, because a lot of folks had to uh, come out there and reintroduce themselves to people, had to actually introduce themselves to people. I'm pretty sure there are people tonight that they, did, they, they forgot about people people from last night. Um, so those are the time we have enough time um, over the next couple of months as we get th- through more debates to actually frame the party's uh, message uh, as, as to how to go after Trump. And I think it's going to be very difficult if you're not asked direct questions about that uh, to kind of weave that into it because there's a lot, not a lot of time. Uh, 60 seconds is not a lot of time to kind of make a debate that's not it's solely about you as a candidate from right. the jump. Speaking um, of questions, can we debate the, the the quality of the questions? Did you think that they were good enough to get some, to give you a real idea of where these people are? I, I think are, some of the questions uh, were good, and that goes to both nights. Uh, and I think some of them, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know, for, uh, for a debate this size, it's very difficult to try and right. include everybody in it. I think that they raised some good issues that they clearly knew that, you know, the the racial issue was going to be something that uh, you know that is for something for Mayor Pete to talk about, and then also they they knew where they were going to when they were going to get uh, where they were going to um, rattle Biden basically, you know. So it was very pointed, but I think a, an event like this needs to be, you know. I, I don't. I mean, it's not 
you know, it's not a... Uh, despite what uh, the other side will tell you about MSNBC and the personalities on it, I mean, this was not like a, you know, a DNC right. event. And so also, I think the fact that some of the candidates looked uncomfortable at times was good. I, I right. think that they shouldn't coast through this debate because whoever is the nominee is not going to have a, an easy time against uh, President Trump. And whoever uh, is, you know, uh, on a stage with uh, with Pence for the VP debate, what were you going to say, Drexel? I was just going to say, I think that, you know, I always go into movies, and, you know, my husband Tim will tell you, uh, that I always go into movies uh, with low expectations mm -hmm. of what I'm about to watch. And I think that we have... To, we go into we went some folks went into this first debate thinking that it was going to be the one to set the tone. Th this was not a debate to set the tone of this of, of the primary. Right. It was just something that there are just too many people, and we 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 we, we can't expect all these candidates to say you know this that and the third like you know Senator Sanders and folks know how I feel about Bernie Sanders. Uh, um, well, uh, you you have to reintroduce yourself to this. Song. Sure, that's true. He's people basically anti-Bernie. <laughs> right. I'll just uh, put it succinctly. <laughs> well, you know. Um, Bernie would say that that's ageist. The fact yeah. that you don't like it. That, I I heard him in the garbage. I know I heard him in the in the post uh, the yes. post uh, the post game interview as as you can call it. And people raising the questions as to whether or not seventy three years old is too old to be president is an ageist because if you're hiring a construction team to build a house and they're all seventy three, you think you know what? I don't know that they're up to the job. Yeah, because so they that's can't. Not they may not be able to perform the core functions of the job. Correct. And Sure, this, I, in this world, you can. Well, I mean, think of, our, think of our oldest presidents that we have. We have Ronald Reagan and we have Donald Trump. Sure. So those are two of the oldest people to sit in that office. And, and one th what, I, what my point was on, on, on Senator Sanders is that you had a lot of folks on the stage, and Bernie Sanders became an afterthought in this entire debate. And, uh, you know, he looked for for what he considers himself to be a front runner um he seemed very small compared to the some of the other uh folks that were on that stage and i think he's going to have a harder time with somebody like kamala harris up there who can debate very well as we can see uh somebody like elizabeth warren who is not going to give him a pass like um hillary clinton did uh i don't think the i think the women are very prepared for Joe Biden and for Bernie Sanders. And they're certainly not going to um, let them get Would, a, would a you anymore. characterize, this sort of goes back to something I raised in the beginning that we haven't quite gotten to yet. Uh, would you say that this was a, was this a bad night for Bernie? It, it, or was uh, it, it was an average night for Bernie and he, you know, just sort of highlighted where he stands and all this? Sure. I think the headlines will not mention Bernie Sanders. The headlines they, are mentioning Biden. And, and if yeah. they do mention Bernie Sanders, it will be that he, it, it, not in a positive light. Not because he did not, not because the things that he has not said has not been consistent, but because he did not rise to the occasion that everybody expected him to rise I, into. I think that you're forgetting that one of the biggest issues, healthcare and corruption, the, there were people that mentioned money and politics and how are we going to clean stuff up. All of them, the, the first one to say any of this stuff was Bernie Sanders. So all sure, of them are caring of a, sure, a, a, but that a was variation. Sure, but that was 2016. This is 2019. We, we're, we're, we're in the process of trying to elect They're a, having a, his a conversation. So sure. And they're he having, won on right. some level. And they're having this conversation without Bernie Sanders, and they will continue to have this conversation without Bernie Sanders going Bernie into 2020. Sanders gave them permission to sure, have Bernie the conversation. Sure, Bernie Sanders didn't give anybody permission no to do No one anything. was talking about this um, stuff before him, sure. and these people have uh, been around listen, since I, I think, before 2016. I think there are a lot of, of issues that Bernie has uh, certainly latched himself onto and made it popular, but these are not issues. Democrats have been talking about health care for years, since the 90s. You know, not they, Medicare for all. What I'm saying is they've talk, been talking about a variation of universal health care for years. So I, I think that, and, and you heard in candidates today talk about uh, how best they wanted to address health care on night one and night two. And I think everybody has a version of universal health care or Medicare for all that they want to address. That does not necessarily mean Bernie has a monopoly on these issues, and he certainly does not. No, but, but I'm saying that the fact that his ideas are now mainstream but means he is sure, one. But but that's even like, if, if, that's, he won the war even if he didn't win the if, battle. If he believes that the cause is more important than him being the nominee, which sure. I actually don't think he does. I, if, I look, would <laughs> entirely disagree I, with you. I, I, I just this is all based on his uh, his post debate uh, interview sure. with uh, Andrea Mitchell, right. where you just I I see a guy who, for all of the ideas that he brings to the table, is a lifelong politician, and lifelong politicians love being politicians, and, and, and they want to keep being politicians, and you keep wanting to get the next best job, and there's only one more job that he can try to get that he hasn't had. I think that the nomination was. Uh, 
he didn't get a fair chance at the nomination in 2016, let's put it that way. And I think it's probably made him uh, want it even more than he did uh, four years ago or three and a half years ago, whatever. I just wanted to point sure. out, just in, in terms of the healthcare question, because B Bernie had the first question of the night for the most yes. part. And, you know, like the front runner, like, like a couple of people at the debate yesterday, he had to be reminded to answer yeah. the actual well, direct question. That, but to and, be fair, a lot of people had to get the reminder. And what I'll say is I'll give him credit for... You know, it's not necessarily the way to win, but for credit for saying yes, I'm going to raise taxes in the middle class. Right, but, I, but he tried he did, to not answer. He tried it. to not answer the yeah. question, and then and I think the moderators have been doing a good job of saying, yeah. I need you to answer the question." I, I would say that that's your... the best thing that they did is they would do that. I'm going to give you ten more seconds. Could you please answer which the question? Which they did not do in the last election, right. which they have not. You know, right, so. which is not something you usually see. Um, for me, I would say that somebody that I know very little about, and I first heard the name from Chelsea is Marianne Williamson. Uh, this was not a good night for her. I don't know what she's doing here. I don't know how she qualified. Uh, I did hear her say things that I've heard Chelsea say before. So it's like it was it was a reminder of like, I know why you, why you at least in some level like some of what she has to say. I don't know if you actively think she's a great candidate, but I know that you like some of what she has to say. And I heard a lot of things throughout the night that I was like, oh, it's it's almost like all these people are vying for Chelsea because you heard a lot of them saying things I'm like, I've heard you say this, I've heard you say that, you know, and it's just like, and they're all like trying to find the right thing that'll make you go, yes, I love Alan Yang. That's who my guy Alan is. Yang. I'm just picking somebody who Andrew, I know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Do you know anybody's name? No. Uh, I, there's <laughs> That's Jim, why we're here. There's Jim <laughs> Biden. Jim, Jim Biden. Biden is great. Uh, and um, Colonel Sanders. I already forget who um, we were talking about. Oh, yeah, eleven herbs and spices. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so not a lot of flavor. Uh, but uh, what do you? Who who do you think that? Uh, and, I, and I'll only let you pick one. Mm -hmm. Who do you think that this was just not a great night for? There's um, no wrong answer. Even, well, if they're not on the stage, it becomes a more difficult answer. Okay, so I'm going to take the bait that you put out for me, and I will say it was not a great night for Marianne Williamson. Yeah. As uh, you know, I, I was a volunteer on her campaign, and right. I and I firmly believe in what she stands for and, and, and the positions that she has. And my framing of, of what's important is largely paint colored by my experience uh, on, on her campaign. I didn't hear her dig deep on the things that brought me to be a supporter of her. She did mention taking on why are things like this? It's because of food policy and environment and chemical policy. Yes. Um, and then she kind of went off on, on think the president of New Zealand. Like She yeah, tried to be cute with that. That's the specific moment and where she, I was like, oh, come on. And then she did exactly what I figured she was going to do, which would take her and I feel like the sort of spiritual searcher community down a notch, which in her closing, she said, you know, I'm going to make, you know, Donald Trump operates on, on fear and I'm going to operate on love. And it, it just does not make sense in this context to understand what she's saying. You kind of have to read her books or the, the, the course in miracles, which calls a miracle, a shift in perspective from one of fear to love. But just saying that in a 45 second thing about what it does not, it doesn't work. I, and it, I think it, it, brought her down and brought the idea of the power of love. Actually, it trivialized I, it because I, I she only had 45 seconds. I think this format was not uh, something that was tailor made for her. You know, it was not, it was not, to, I, she might do very well just speaking to a crowd. I, I don't know. I mean, you Amazingly. volunteered. Amazingly. Yeah. I just, and I think that there are a lot of people who clearly did not get that much time. And so then they try to make the most of the time that they do get. Uh, but uh, yeah. I, I think I, it's one of those like in life, like a thing to do is to hear Marianne Williamson speak when she is at her best. And I'm saying this as somebody who has not donated to this campaign at all, who has not volunteered, and who's, who's frankly had a bit of a personal falling out. Um, but to, to listen to her and to under, to, she is phenomenal. But I knew that this was not going to turn out well. This is not where she does well. And um, I think it was, you know, unfortunate for her um, that she chose, you know, and I knew a very long time ago that she was planning to run for president and I uh, have never thought it was a good idea and her whole thing about she just wanted to get on the debate stage but that is not going to do anything for for her or for the 
the perspective that she wishes to um, encourage the American people to take. So I, I would say that that was the unfortunate uh, outcome for uh, her. Uh, I, I want to uh, use the phrase me too, not in the way that we use it now, but in the way what it used to mean, which was, the, and that's the way that I think that Joe Biden was using it, because he invoked a lot of Obama's track record, and it, and it was in the, the old style of me too. Like, hey, I was there too, remember me? Mm. And I you, look. I don't know how involved he was, but as vice president, it doesn't strike me. I, it struck me as he was taking way too much credit for what President Obama did, and I don't know a better way he could have done that. I, so I'm not even saying that it was right. He just I think he did it one time too many for me. Uh, am I wrong in in that feeling, Drexel? Uh, do you think he actually is more involved or was more involved uh, in the Obama administration than I think he was? I mean, I don't know. We weren't there, but yeah. I think that. President Obama is the m most popular Democrat in the country, and if you're going to tie yourself to anybody, oh, uh, he is well, the most popular Democrat in the country. And uh, so, if you're going to tie yourself to where's somebody, where's that poll? I need Scott. If where the heck going is Scott to when you tie need yourself him? to somebody? Um, you're certainly going to tie yourself to uh, you know to, to President Obama. So, do you think that President Obama would have won this debate if he was up there? In, in either of these rounds well, yesterday. Well, now today. That, he, that he's kind of like retired, he probably started smoking <laughs> again, you know, he's but just the, hanging but out. But now he think, seems too moderate. I think that President Obama, if, if it was a 2007 President Obama going up against this group, President Obama would be fine in this in this group because if you remember, President Obama came with a lot of fire in 2007. He was um, a lot more left uh, yeah. uh, of the thing, and right. I think the presidency forces you back to the center because now you have a whole swath. Which is of why people. you need to go in a little um, bit more to the left. Sure. So when it pulls you back to the right, you sure, end up you in the center. But you don't want to you don't want to go off the cliff. Right. And I think that some people are ready no, to go off no, the cliff. No, no, um, no. Look, regardless but, of how popular Obama is, it does make sense. He, look, he's still very popular. Uh, I think you have a lot of Democrats that uh, if somehow all of a sudden. And it's like, oh, actually, you know what? Sure. We, we, we missed some paperwork. He can actually get a third term. I think people would very happily nope. vote. And I think you see that. And I think so you see that. So you, you, would, you wouldn't vote for Barack Obama. Well, I mean, if, if he was no, a nominee. No, but if he if was your ballot on is one of Barack 20. Obama, Donald Trump. You're just not going to vote that, that day? That is not what I said. Okay. Well, that's why I that's I'm why saying I had to... if he was one of the 20, he right. would not be my choice for the nominee. But I think the other so part... So Jimmy, Jimmy Yang would be your choice? Oh, my sure. God, Jimmy Yang. Uh, but I think the other part of the, the, the equation certainly are African-American voters, which is Barack Obama is like at probably 98% approval rating amongst African-American voters, uh, particularly in the Democratic Party. So I think that if you are going to tie yourself, Joe Biden is polling higher than anyone uh, in this race with African-American voters and higher than the two African-American candidates as well. Kamala Harris certainly is racking up the endorsements in South Carolina, as she should be. Um, and I'm sure she'll do Maryland. She has racked up almost every endorsement here in California. Um, so you're starting to see that. But I think Joe Biden still being the most popular candidate among African-American voters, he's going to tie himself to the most popular African-American candidate because he knows that is going to win over African-American voters. So it is a smart move for from a numbers game. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how that's going to play over well, um, you know, a, a, as we start to look down the down the line. But you know, it, you know, to go back to your question on who kind of who kind of Lost probably shouldn't tonight. be on this stage at all, um, Marianne well, Williamson. Well, a, but, she won the criteria. She no, got no, the yeah, criteria. She should be on what, the what stage. I'm, so what, 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 yeah, yeah, she won't be on the next stage. Is what I'm saying. Um, she, she's <laughs> no way. She's kidding. I would be really shocked um, after tonight. Um, but I also think that Andrew Yang really. For somebody whose main issue uh, was universal basic income, to not be able to explain how it works and to explain how you're going to pay for it when it is your signature issue is disappointing. It, it, I was just so like, that's I'm, a debate question what, issue, what which I'm is saying, why I thought they got like a C. They, on they this. gave him the plat. They gave him the time right. to talk about it, and they said, "This is it." And then he started to talk about it. And then I was like, "So are you going to explain?" Well, he how asked. Any of that? He was asked only how basically how would you pay for it, and that's why sure. he had to talk about. Well, it's hard to do it when you have Amazon paying no tax. You'd have to do a value added tax and do a trickle up economy. Yeah, that, yeah but you're that, trying to you're trying to oversimplify a question but by how just do saying. You, you, you oh, can't I'm saying explain is, it for. 
say if you if this is your only issue, is this the one issue that you are known for, and this is how you got to the debate stage? You better have a really good. He, you better have multiple answers for one issue. I, I, and I think just, he did great at answering that question. But I, I mean, I was just shocked that he couldn't answer it. Kind of like. Bernie Sanders tonight. He couldn't answer mm. a lot of questions tonight. Uh, we were sort of talking. You, know, you uh, Drexel, a moment ago, you were talking about you know Joe Biden trying to you know uh, b- b- attach himself to President Obama because of the popularity that that would bring in the uh, the black community. Obviously. Uh, that's been a bit of an issue, and Kamala Harris uh, did a great job of raising it, and I think that is rightly what everyone is really talking about. There's some other... She had a lot of uh, really strong moments, one of which was when race... Well, the food fight was good. That was the first one. Uh, And then when a a racial question came up, uh, she she wasn't going to be asked anything, but then she made the the Mm -hmm. moderators give her time. As the only... Yes, as as the only African-American on the stage. Can I I please speak about race. Right. I think you know what she didn't say. Please, I think I'm going to speak right. about race, which almost mim, which also was almost mirrored the question last night on women's issues that um, that Amy Klobuchar brought up, and that should have been uh, Tulsi Gabbard and Amy Klobuchar and Elizabeth Warren's time to talk about women's issues in yeah. the way that Kamala Harris just commanded the race issue uh, tonight, and you know it got to the point where the moderators didn't even she. I'm, Hundred percent, she went over the time that she was supposed to be allotted, and they were not going to interrupt her in that time because they were like, "Well, this is very serious," and they split screened it because they knew what was going to happen. Yeah. and uh, and she talked about it in a way that um, I think she's going to get. He's certainly going to get hit um, on her prosecutorial record here in California with black voters, uh, but it certainly gave her an opening right. um, to be able to connect with black voters probably a little bit more than she has in the past by saying, "I'm addressing this head on, and I'm going to continue to address this." Because that whole anecdote, I mean, it was clearly it was clearly a rehearsed anecdote. Sure, but it landed to where you where everybody was like, "Well, do you think that she's going to be accused of like destroying the front runner the way that Bernie was accused of taking down Hillary?" I mean, if you try and take down Joe Biden on this really sensitive issue, sure, I think no, I think that Kamala Harris um, uh, will be a candidate who people see as an equal to Joe Biden on a certain level. Mm. I don't know that that any I don't know that a, obviously a majority of Democratic voters uh, agree uh, that Bernie Sanders was on equal footing in terms of um, with Hillary Clinton. But I think in this case, Kamala Harris is strong enough. And I said it today, you know, we saw what we saw a reason as to why Kamala Harris deserves to be on that debate stage and what and what a, a large swath of uh, voters in South Carolina and in uh, California and and what folks are going to start to see across the country it only helps her in the polls to knock Joe Biden down a couple of pegs because in the next debate she went after Joe Biden if I were Kamala Harris I would go after Bernie Sanders next and I think that she's going to start to pick off people to bring her poll numbers up, yeah. to bring everybody down a little bit because she's already shot across. Uh, 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 Is she going to do that to Elizabeth Warren? Because Elizabeth well, Warren. No, I, I, I think I think that eventually, if it, it's down to her and Elizabeth, which I would love, um, <laughs> I would love that. Um, I, I think they're going to talk. They're going to frame their experience. Uh, in a way that is going to be respectful, uh, but will also be very challenging to each other. Elizabeth's going to hit Kamala on a more her more moderate record as a, as a prosecutor in, in San Francisco, and and Kamala is probably going to hit Elizabeth on on being uh, a, a coastal elite who um, who people have a hard time connecting with. And so I would certainly like right. to see that. So before we run out of time, uh, we talked a little bit about night one, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because uh, we did a show on that last night. If you haven't seen it, you. Can <laughs> Go ahead and find it. Uh, it uh, so let's say, uh, so from last night's debate stage, Elizabeth Warren is, I would say, the most high-profile candidate, the, the one with the best name recognition, the best poll numbers for sure. If you could only take, this is very hypothetical, if you could only take one other person, so out of that 10, Elizabeth Warren is going to move on to the next round, the next debate, but only one other person, who do you think, based on their performance last night, would be the the one who, along with Elizabeth Warren because it's, she's kind of an obvious answer. Uh, who do you think it ha- was it had the strongest showing last night and belongs on the debate stage? You know more so than somebody like Marion Williamson or other people who were up there tonight. I see Chelsea thinking long and hard. I'm, I'm looking over the uh, names that Drexel. Yeah, right so if Drexel has an answer, we'll let, we'll let Chelsea continue to ponder. I think it should have been the person who should have been the vice presidential nominee in 2016, and that is Julian Castro. 
Yeah, um, I did think he had a he had some really good moments last night. You know, I, I thought, don't know what that was. That was very <laughs> well, that funny. was that was the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> um, yeah, but, um, but listen, we'll have we'll have our we'll be back with our final thought in a moment. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, but I, listen, I think that Julian Castro. Um, I, I think his ability to jockey Beto O'Rourke last night yeah. showed that he can debate well. Um, not only can he debate well, but he can attack well. And I think that you're, that is something that um, was needed uh, last night. I, I wish that he would have called out folks who are... There was a lot of Spanish speaking last night, and I and and, and listen, it was a lot of Rosetta Stone style Spanish speaking last night. Um, but if I were him, you know, I, I would yeah. remind people that you know he's the one that 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 grew up in in the way that people believe better work grew up, uh, and, and that is not the case, and that he uh, certainly is a candidate um, that will be able to reach out to a what I believe, and I'm sure everybody else knows, is going to be the largest voting block in America. Uh, over the next decade, uh, which is the Hispanic community, so I, I think that Julian Castro deserves to be on the next debate stage um, with the, with the big times, and then that will that will show us on whether or not he can be president. Um, I still believe he would make a great vice president. Sure, um, and but. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, but yeah. I, I don't have a response. All I do, all I can do, is come up with a reason to disagree with Drexel. <laughs> so my you don't have anybody. Do. You think Elizabeth Warren is the only one from last night who, you know, again, this is a hypothetical. You don't, you don't take anybody from last night. You said if, if this, I mean, if I this guess were I could say Booker, on, but like, no. yeah, well, but, see but here, but I, if I, I could have a second to to explain why I would disagree with Drexel, Julian Castro made a very passionate plea to. Um, to revert, I, I, I said this like last night, and I should the regulation yeah, or the part of the of uh, um, an act that would make sex, section thirteen twenty five right, right. that would make instead of it being a criminally illegal to come across the border, that it would just be a civil penalty, and I think that. Um, not like we should all just care about what Trump's going to say about that, but that feeds into this whole open border thing. And I think that more attention should be to helping the the area, the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador clean up um, the reasons why people are leaving uh, for us to fix as best we can the, our, the effect that we have had on exploiting the area. I think that would have been better than to say we should effectively make it easier and incentivize people to come over more. I think that that was going to turn off some uh, independents and definitely some Republicans. Sure, but I also think to that point, um, the question tonight about whether or not uh, illegal immigrants should have health care certainly is going to be a question that I, I think either way, Democrats are going to get hit because every hand went up on that stage tonight and on almost all the front I think runners. it was a very so damaging question I was to actually ask. shocked that they that nobody hesitated. Actually, Joe Biden was the only one that hesitated to raise his yeah. hand, which I was like, are you going to raise like, When you see everybody else does do, right. And by the way, uh, if, if you go, I think it's on the Drudge Report, you can see oh, the cover, well, you can see the cover of the New York Post from tomorrow, which is, uh, it's that picture of everybody raising their hand, and then the question above it is, who wants to lose the election? And everybody's got their hand raised. Uh, that's not an issue that, I, I mean, that can be an issue that, uh, you know, for... You don't even have to be that far to the left. You can be, but if you're solidly, you know, a Democrat, you you could feel that way and maybe disagree. But I think for moderates and and yeah, like Chelsea said, especially for Republicans, that it, that is not a winning issue. And because we only have a, a really a couple minutes, I do want to kind of circle back to the point that was raised. So who was it? Was it Hickenlooper that said that socialism can't be Trump? Yeah. So. Uh, I'm inclined to agree that if the Democratic nominee identifies himself or herself as a socialist, even if you say Democratic socialist, uh, I think it becomes very easy for President Trump to run against that uh, because oh, yeah. that's a very damaging word. So I'm not asking this specifically about Bernie. I'm saying if whomever the nominee is, if they identify as if the word socialist is something mm -hmm. that they use to describe themselves, do you think that they can win against Donald Trump in 2020? Um, probably not, but this, yeah. but I'm heartened by the language of like Elizabeth Warren and sure. Kirsten Gillibrand, who is like, we want to clean up the corruption in our capitalism. Yes. And so um, I like that that language now is 
more center. I, I like the fact that we have more left candidates to that because then it makes them look center. Whereas if we didn't have Bernie, then they would be the left and then they would be accused of, sure. of socialism just because of where they lay on but the But I spectrum. also think to your point, Elizabeth Warren's uh, version of Kirsten and Kirsten Gillibrand had a really great answer on capitalism tonight. We we clearly see that Kirsten Gillibrand is a capitalist. Being able to explain capitalism in a way that is not a dirty word um, to the American people, which which is what Bernie does not do, um, is something that is a winning issue for a large swath of Americans. And and Bernie not being able to explain that um, is is to his detriment because I think that if you if, if we are going to talk about corruption and if you believe that Bernie is the one that brought it up first. He has not been able to explain what I'm saying is he's not been able to explain it in a way that it brings more people to the table across all different spectrums. I have because I've heard him speak in person where he had like 20 minutes to explain. Sure, but I think that when you don't have 20 minutes and you've got to, you've got to be able to uh, effectively uh, ex- uh, tell the American people where you stand, uh, you better have a good answer. And this is not Bernie's first rodeo, and he was unable to explain a lot of stuff tonight. And, oh, um, man, you, know, you are just... And, I forget but, how... But, but I also... I hate. But, <laughs> it's not hate. I'm just saying for what it was, for a front runner. There was a lot of missed opportunity tonight. It wasn't. It well, was not about. It's not about Bernie. It's yeah. just like with Joe Biden had a lot of missed opportunity tonight, and for the most part, uh, you know that was a problem for him, and he was not able to do that. I also think that Democrats should have been tying themselves. If you want to really talk about corruption, they should have been tying themselves to HR one, which was the Democrats' first bill out of the House this year, um, and, and really talking about uh, the things that Democrats have been doing uh, over the last six months, which is this is what Democrats are doing. This is what we plan on on, on going forward with. I agree with you. Know, can't say I agree with Nancy Pelosi, but I agree with X, Y, and Z and the policies that we've been putting forth. And Republicans haven't been doing that over the past decade or, or two. And they're blocking it because of corruption, they're not doing their job. Mitch right. McConnell gets to decide which Supreme Court members are right. you know, right. so, anyway. We're we're pretty much out of time and no, I no. do want to give credit to everybody who was in the chat, uh, Storage Yard Resident, pointing out that we have not incorporated the conversation from the chat. Storage Yard Resident, <laughs> uh, we love that you're always here. Here's what I'm going to say to you. Uh, when we have our next live show, which will not be this Tuesday, it'll be Tuesday, July 9th, uh, please raise the question that you did in the chat. Uh, which is uh, America does not need any more immigration. Uh, we don't have time to answer that, but we could spend a whole show on it. That well, <laughs> that, that's why I want to really have that conversation, but we don't have the time for it. Uh, but what I will give you is that when I was talking about if uh, if uh, Barack Obama could magically get a third term, he said uh, uh, President Trump deserves a third term. Wow. So, I, you know, he, he's through and through very consistent. So no more of Republicans saying we are law and order, we believe in the Constitution, well, because that's literally... He just deserves it. No. Hey, I just tried to give Barack Obama a third term, all right? So let's let's be honest. Uh, anyway, we appreciate everybody's there in the chat, uh, including Tim, who's not usually there, by the way. I know. So, but that's because you're not usually Hi, there. Hi, Tim. Yeah, true. it was great to see you. Uh, great to see everyone. Uh, so, yes, as I mentioned, our next live show uh, will be Tuesday, July 9th mostly just because uh, well we had two shows this week but I'm going to be away with my family so uh, everybody have a good uh, 4th of July and uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Christian DMZ Chelsea where do people find you? On Twitter at Chelsea Galicia and Drexel where do people find you and they should at Drexel Hurt Thank you uh, so much to everyone. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Uh, We'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks. Bye. Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menounos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.